The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, the webinar will start in a couple minutes. We're just waiting for uh, attendees to finish joining, so please bear with us for a couple more moments, and we will get the webinar started in just a second. Thank you. Okay, again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, we are going to start our webinar today entitled, When Disaster Strike, What We Learned from Hurricane Irene. My name is Robert Bowman. I'm the Senior Marketing Manager with Higher Ground. And today's webinar is sponsored by Higher Ground. And we would like to thank Avtech, the Vermont Emergency Management, and Burlington Communications for participation and the presentation this afternoon. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we kick it off. You're currently muted, so if you do have any questions, you should see a little question box in the toolbar. If you, need a, if you have a question, go ahead and feel free to submit the question, and at the end of the presentation, we'll open it up to questions and have a question and answer session. Also, this webinar is being recorded, so if you have a colleague or friend that you feel might benefit from viewing this webinar, they'll be able to view it later. Uh, on the Higher Ground website, which is capture911.com. And uh, so let's kick it off. I'm going to pass the uh, controls over to Todd Goad with Burlington Communications. Go ahead, Todd. Hey, welcome, everyone. Um, like Robert said, my name is Todd Goad. Uh, my company is Burlington Communications. I am uh, Rob Shell's radio and dispatch console vendor. Uh, my company supports the majority of public safety dispatch centers in Vermont, including Vermont's four locally owned 911 PSAPs. Uh, there are actually eight 911 PSAPs in Vermont. The other four are owned and maintained by the state of Vermont themselves. Now, today the story is really about Rob Shell's experience, uh, you know, sitting in Vermont Emergency Management during Hurricane Irene. Uh, but I'm here to answer any technical questions that may arise uh, about his uh, dispatch system. My title uh, says sales manager these days, but all my experience comes from the service side of dispatch communications. I've crawled under many a dispatcher's desk to trace wires, so if any technical questions come up, uh, just ask me. And Actually, I'll pass it over to Rob to introduce himself. Thank you, Todd. Um, my name's Robert Schell, and it's, it's a pleasure to be able to talk with everyone today and uh, just share the Vermont uh, experience uh, as a result of Hurricane uh, Irene. And uh, I just hope to, to tell our story today, which is definitely still an ongoing one in terms of recovery. Um, my job at emergency management is essentially we are the state version of FEMA. So we do the response recovery, mitigation, and preparedness training and uh, activities surrounding any kind of disaster uh, response that occurs in our state, of which we have one. 
So with that, uh, I look forward to uh, talking with you. And we have some uh, good pictures and depictions and a lot of great information today. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, my name is Kevin Williams. I'm the VP of Product Development here at Avtech. Uh, that means I have responsibility for our marketing, engineering, and customer support activities within the organization. And I'm going to get us started today with a, with a couple quick slides. We'll, we'll start with uh, just a quick agenda. I'm going to take these first couple items, give you a, a quick overview of, of dispatching, specifically IP dispatching, and then talk about disaster recovery scenarios and how an IP-based system uh, can assist in recovering from various types of situations that may occur. Then I'm going to hand back over to Robert, and he's going to walk through Vermont Emergency Management and specifically Hurricane Irene. We'll start with the dispatching overview. So really, any, any kind of discussion about dispatching always includes workers out in the field with, with land mobile radios, uh, generally several workers out in the field that use a radio tower to communicate amongst themselves and, and accomplish some task. And so here's a fairly general purpose worker. Maybe he's a miner. Uh, maybe he's construction or maintenance for a building. There's various scenarios and, and roles that these that may play out here. But at some point, the, the geographic nature of those workers being spread out or the need to synchronize their activities requires the need for a dispatch center and a command and control type of environment where you have a, an operator at a desk that's coordinating with these workers out in the field. Now, to connect the dispatching center with the the field personnel. In an IP-based system, you would use a WAN connection for, uh, to accomplish that. You would take the radio infrastructure and connect that up to the WAN. And you would drop in some sort of servers. Uh, in our Aptech system, we call these VP gates, voice protocol gateways, that would connect to the radio infrastructure and then back to the dispatcher and convert between various radio protocols and, and provide the dispatcher with a, a common interface. And once that basic system is in place, you can then scale to add a second position for dispatching, or really multiple positions for dispatching, uh, to coordinate the, the activity of those workers in the field. And that's your basic IP-based dispatching system. Uh, along with the VP gates, the, this diagram is fairly simplified. You may have logging recorders. You may have other uh, equipment in that office environment as well uh, to create a, a full dispatching uh, system. But for the sake of today's discussion, I've tried to simplify. Now. Along with the main dispatch center, there may also be remote workers, uh, perhaps, that need to do some dispatching function. In an IP-based system, you can connect those remote workers with the, the same network connection back to so that that remote worker can go to those VP gates and connect out to the radio infrastructure in the field. You may also, as your system grows, need to have various positions in the, in the RF, whether it's spectrum issues or uh, the size of the area you're trying to cover, or just different technologies, different frequencies that you're communicating with, you may have various connections into that WAN with different radio infrastructure. These may be used in dispatching. You may be communicating with trains. You may communicate with aircraft, uh, various sort of user use cases that exist here, utilities, delivery services. Uh, the most common, or one of the largest, and the one we're going to talk about today is your first responders, your police, and your fire. But really, the, the takeaway from that slide is that it, modern communication systems have many different types of communication devices. You have radios. You have conventional radio systems, trunked radio systems. You have older analog systems and newer digital systems. Uh, in some ways, with an IP-based system, you're going to convert that back to a, an Ethernet connection into the, the infrastructure of the, the organization. But you're also wanting to integrate telephony devices into into most dispatching scenarios, whether that's a cellular PTT service or that's a, a voice over IP phone. And really, to enable both of those, we've seen an ongoing trend of open standards, P25 being the most prominent example of that in public safety. But other standards have started to emerge as well that allow these interoperability between systems. So if we return to our, our picture here again, and we think a little bit about how the system might uh, evolve or uh, grow, especially as you add more radio infrastructure, more users in the field. Uh, perhaps instead of having those VP gates at the dispatch center, they may be placed at a data center at another site, uh, again connected to the to the wide area network. And then those dispatchers at the top could use the, the VP gate machines at the data center to convert the protocol into whatever radio frequency device they need to talk to and speak to a worker out in the field. We may also have remote workers in remote office locations. 
Uh, perhaps these are administrative supervisory type positions as, as the dispatcher starts to escalate an issue, they may need to tie them in as well. And they would benefit from a, a single user interface that would not only let them talk to the workers in the field, but also let even a remote dispatcher talk through to a, a remote office worker, bring them into the conversation or just alert them to, to what's going on. And then as we get to really the topic we're talking about today, with, which is disaster recovery, we start to think about scenarios where we would add a backup center. And this backup center would look very similar to the dispatch center, would have a, a similar set of servers connected into the, to the uh, wide area network, would have positions for one or multiple dispatchers connected together, uh, may also have additional office personnel that exist at that location that are tied into the network as well. And really, now you start to see how things uh, connectivity really expands and really you can get to to maybe the dispatch worker at the backup center could use even the VP gates at the main center to talk out into a, to a police officer in the field or the remote dispatcher could use another set of VP gates to talk to that backup office worker uh, but really the ultimate goal that you, you arrive at with an IP based system is this idea of any to any connectivity and what does that mean well any type of endpoint whether that's a radio, whether that's a phone, any communication device, regardless of the underlying technology, being tied into a, a unified interface that the dispatcher can communicate with that endpoint, but not just one, one dispatcher, but really any dispatcher, or even dispatcher to dispatcher type communication where you can collaborate across dispatchers, where you can have supervisory type functions where they would take over or monitor uh, activity as it goes on at different dispatching positions being able to patch and conference those dispatchers together so they can collaborate and, and solve problems and, and, uh, and make all that happen in real time and really be able to do that at any time. And any time means that you've got a fault tolerant system uh, so that when things happen in the real world, your system can recover, that operations can continue and failover is, is automatic or can happen very, very quickly. So if we go back to our, our picture now and talk about some disaster recovery scenarios, we go back to where we, we left off last time, but let's talk about if, uh, if something goes wrong, if, if some failure occurs at a single point in the system. Well, all of the VP gates that you see there are pictured with two boxes in that picture, and the reason for that is that there's built-in automatic redundancy. So if one, one box is the primary, the other is the secondary, if the primary server stops functioning, the secondary server will take over automatically and, and continue uh, the connectivity out to the, to the endpoints that it's connected to. So that's a very simple kind of failure that's just built in inherently to the system. But what happens if other things um, cease to function properly? What if a, a, a radio tower in the field goes away? And the connection to those workers is now lost from that tower because it, it stopped functioning. Well, if the VP gates in the data center say we're responsible for that tower, if those VP gates are able to detect and adjust to that, they may be able to select an adjacent tower that has some overlapping coverage that could then reconnect with that worker and allow him to, to again, communicate with the dispatcher. So even that remote dispatcher could use those VP gates to talk to that worker in the field now and the connection could be restored seamlessly to the, to the dispatcher. Uh, but what happens if a facility becomes uninhabitable? What if those dispatchers at the dispatch center are not able to access the building, whether it's uh, what we sometimes referred to as a white powder incident where it's just not safe for humans to be in the building or uh, it's just inaccessible for some other reason. Getting to and from it is, is no longer possible. Well, those workers then could relocate to the backup center and from the backup center still access the equipment in the dispatch center to reach the workers in the field. But what happens then if not just the, the building is uninhabitable and, and the equipment was still functioning, but what if the entire building was destroyed or ceases to exist or function properly, a, a black hole type scenario that we, we refer to as well. What if you have that situation? Well, in that case, your remaining VP gates uh, should be able to, in a, in a fault tolerant IP dispatching environment, detect that kind of failure and take over and resume the connectivity with the, uh, with the endpoints in the field so that that dispatcher in the backup center could then use one of those VP gates to get out to, say, that train in the field. But what if the backup center goes away? You have multiple failures now across different areas, and workers are no longer able to 
to access or that facility does not function in any way, there's a power outage, lots of reasons that could happen. Well, if you still have your remote dispatchers and you still have some VP gates in your data center, then you could still reach workers in the field with those VP gates at the data center being reconfigured to access all endpoints. So the, the takeaway here is that there are, there are some best practices in dispatching consoles and IP-based consoles and how they deal with disaster recovery. Uh, the first of those is the any-to-any -any connectivity that I mentioned earlier. Any dispatcher being able to connect to any endpoint allows for seamless recovery from white powder or uninhabitable vacated facility type incidents where the equipment may still function but people are not able to to work locally in that in that building. The next piece is really automatic failover. As you have these failures, you need a system that can automatically recover and definitely your mission critical components. You're uh, in, in the scout world for Avtech, that's the VP gates that I talked about, that's the outpost uh, radio over IP box that we make, the console positions are, are redundant. They need to be able to fail over automatically where if one of those goes away, there's multiple in place and the, the secondary units can take over. And the next is the need for remote consoles and this is something that it's very often uh, discussed, but certainly in a disaster scenario becomes amplified. The, the dynamic nature of what's going on uh, makes it even more necessary to be able to adapt and adjust the system and, and connect workers in ways that, that maybe wasn't completely foreseen, but, uh, but the system needs the flexibility to be able to do that in, a, in an easy way that can be handled in a, in a disaster situation. And then the last is the WAN failover. As you have entire sites go down or, or be uh, cease to function, you need a way for the existing sites to assume those responsibilities to maintain system operability. So those are really the four kind of tenets of a, of a disaster recovery uh, dispatching system or the best practices that, that should be adhered to. Uh, but all of this has been fairly theoretical and high level. So at this point, with that kind of background behind us, I'm going to give control to Robert and allow him to take us through the uh, a little more real-world scenario of what he experienced in, in Vermont. Robert? Well, thanks very much, Kevin. Um, you addressed a lot of the really important themes, and as we're just going through the, the story of what happened to Vermont, um, those themes are real um, central to a lot of the challenges that we faced. Um, the story here with, with Vermont, um, over the next few slides, we'll, we'll just cover some of the response and the recovery, the ongoing recovery that is happening on a day-to-day -day basis in our state. Um, and uh, towards the end, we'll talk a little bit about the logistics of communications and how those were challenged. Um, I'll talk a fair amount about some of the, the details of, of what uh, happened in our state. Um, the pictures certainly tell a lot uh, of, of what went on. As you can see in the larger picture on the left, um, a lot of our roadways were um, partially or completely eradicated by a flash flood. Um, in the, a lot of the, the silt and the muck runoff uh, while buildings would, would sustain um, some of the, the rainfall, um, the mud flows and various things that were brought about by the water then um, brought a whole host of health hazards and and incapacitations to buildings, uh, even though they are structurally sound uh, in, in terms of being inhabited, um, is another big issue. In the lower right, um, about a half mile from our emergency operations center is a, a brand new fire station uh, built in the town of uh, Waterbury, uh, and this is the morning uh, of the Monday morning of uh, Irene uh, coming through our state. Uh, and as you can see, there was certainly water issues um, right uh, in uh, the primary building where we operated out of. So a few of the uh, sort of backgrounds on uh, on how the storm traversed our state. Um, Vermonters typically don't worry about hurricanes or tropical storms. We do see some residual um, rain bands often from uh, the typical storms that traverse the, the coast. Either they'll flow into the Gulf and then uh, ride up the sort of the East Coast, but by the time they get to New England and specifically Vermont, um, it ends up being some rain, but often not a significant amount. Um, that whole story changed uh, back on August 20th as we started to track and look at the potential tracking for Tropical Storm Irene. 
Um, as the days grew ahead, uh, you know, Vermonters still weren't all that concerned about it. Um, you have to remember that we endure three to four months of uh, two to three to four feet of snow and sub-zero temperatures, so there's a, a fairly hearty outlook on weather issues, and so people weren't necessarily all that, that concerned. Our population is it's one of the most rural states, around 650,000 uh, people. That is, for perspective, one-sixth of the population of Long Island, New York, so you could fit six Vermont populations into just Long Island alone. The interesting sort of history to the, the Irene track is that back in September of 2010, um, as part of our Department of Homeland Security statewide training initiatives, we launched what was called uh, CADEX, or Catastrophic Exercise, which was a uh, large-scale three-day statewide exercise that um, mimicked a hurricane that happened to come up the East Coast and traverse through uh, New York and Massachusetts and come through the spine of the Green Mountains. And uh, we, to this day, continue to um, poke fun at the National Weather Service, who did the uh, predictions uh, based on the, the scenarios. They were just generating these sort of false scenarios based on a potential um, that we always considered low about getting a significant uh, impact from uh, a hurricane. And in this case, it was a tropical storm. However, um, August 28th showed us quite differently as um, in the early morning, uh, late Sunday to early morning hours, um, the hurricane began to uh, traverse the state. Now, typically, the worst winds of a hurricane are to the right side, or if you will, on the east side, um, and the rain tends to be worse on the left. Um, and that pattern did play out uh, in Vermont as we did see some significant uh, winds. However, they weren't um, at certainly at hurricane level. Um, you can see 50 miles per hour there in the lower part of Vermont as it enters around 5 p.m. However, those uh, were isolated gusts that ranged from 30 to 40 miles an hour. So this really wasn't a wind event. This ended up being a very significant uh, rain event. A little more on uh, the preparedness activities leading up to this. On the 26th, uh, our State Emergency Operations Center, which is located in, uh, ironically, Waterbury, Vermont, um, started some uh, initial preparatory um, actions. Uh, we start uh, briefing our agencies called state support functions, and those are the, the transportation, the law enforcement, uh, the Red Cross, all the human service agencies uh, that would be involved in flood response. And so the people were, were ready and aware and uh, understood that we were going to probably get a significant amount of rain, but uh, again, no one really was able to predict um, the, the massive fallout uh, and impact of uh, the rain we actually did see. On the 27th, uh, our State Emergency Operations Center activated to what's called a level, level four. Uh, level four means that we're involving uh, local, state, and federal agencies, and federal agencies are actually in state at the time. Uh, that's what the, the level four uh, gets us to. As a little bit of background, um, it's been a disaster year in our state. Um, in April and May, um, our Lake Champlain went uh, somewhere between 8 to 10 feet over flood stage for the better part of a month, a month and a half. Uh, what this meant is that any of the coastal properties, which were in primarily camps uh, for summer vacationers, um, did completely flood. There was a, an ongoing a significant amount of disaster relief, um, and FEMA actually, and to our advantage, uh, was already in state. Uh, at the time Hurricane uh, or Tropical Storm Irene came through, there were 200 um, FEMA employees already in Vermont at work doing disaster relief work associated with the April and May floods. There was also some central Vermont uh, near Montpelier, the Vermont uh, capital. Um, that also sustained damage in the in the early spring, and that disaster relief work uh, was also actually underway, and that ended up playing a significant part in uh, in our uh, disaster response and uh, subsequent evacuation um, that our emergency operations center had to undergo. 
Continuing on the 27th, uh, the governor, uh, Governor Shumlin, declared a state of emergency. That allows the National Guard to be deployed and readied. Uh, they stationed what are called QRFs, or Quick Reaction Forces, around the state, which are essentially high water uh, clearance vehicles that were available and actually pressed into, into use on multiple occasions due to uh, the amount of water. Uh, as uh, the 28th rolled in around 5 o'clock, uh, now Tropical Storm Irene um, entered the uh, southeast part of our state. Uh, it actually was located right where our uh, single nuclear power plant is. Uh, that ended up having no issues associated with the storm, uh, despite being located next to the Connecticut River. Later that evening, uh, the storm tracked further into the Connecticut River Valley, um, that putting the significant amount of rain uh, fall to the left of the center of the storm, which is right over Vermont primarily. Um, and it continued to exit um, later that night. As uh, we look at sort of the Vermont topography, one thing to understand is that we have a very sort of uh, mountainous uh, terrain. Uh, Vermont is French for Green Mountains, um, and the spines of the Green Mountains run on a north to south uh, traverse of the state. So what happens is we get significant amount of rainfall. And um, is everyone able to see the, the rainfall slide at this point? I'm still showing the preparedness activities one. Yeah, it hasn't changed, Rob. Oh, OK. Well, I, um, so th those spines, um, while we don't have, and here it is, uh, we don't have, we have one large body of water. We don't have any major um, waterways such as the Missi Mississippi or something to that effect. So uh, in larger waterways, you can predict surge. You can uh, project. Um, the amounts of floods, as we saw earlier this year down in Mississippi, where they had to open the floodgates, for example. But Vermont's issue is flash flooding. Um, significant amounts of rain can uh, will go into our Green Mountain ranges. Uh, they will fill the tributaries. Those will all concentrate into smaller streams and rivers. And then ultimately, we can see large volumes of water um, essentially funneled from the mountain range systems uh, into our communities in very short order. Rainfall amounts um, ranged uh, from uh, half inch to an inch an hour. Totals uh, ranged uh, from four to seven inches, although I believe those numbers were higher in some localized amounts. Uh, yeah, I see localized amounts greater than 10, 10 inches. And that's within a uh, roughly a 12 to 10 hour period. Um, and this, the, the other part about this was that this occurred overnight. So residents kind of buttoned down and still were probably a little bit skeptical about the amount of um, damage or rain they might see, um, but awoke to a completely different story. Flash flooding uh, did occur on a lot of the headwaters of our main rivers. Um, the challenges with a lot of these rivers is that uh, there are a lot of roadways that are built next to them. And we'll see some footage of that here very shortly. Back in 1927, um, there was a uh, significant flood that occurred in our state. And these levels brought about by uh, Irene were equal or greater to um, that flood. And the 27 flood is considered um, the largest one that uh, we have experienced, certainly in the last uh, measurable couple centuries. And again, the wind was an, an issue, but we did not have wind-related impacts. Um, those typically would be down power lines, down trees, and those sorts of things. And that wasn't a factor in this storm. This was um, all about water. A little bit more on the response highlights. Um, Pittsfield to the right in that picture uh, shows a house. Uh, residents, um, in some cases, did have to evacuate in multiple places overnight. Um, they would leave their house. They would come back to find it um, inundated with water without a foundation, moved or completely destroyed. Uh, and several people returned to try and find their buildings and their homes to find that they simply were no longer there. And they would find them half mile to miles down, uh, down the, the riverways. So our State Emergency Operations Center, located in Waterbury, Vermont, has always um, been 
located on a floodplain. It's in a, a state office complex, which was formerly uh, our state hospital back in the 1950s. Um, it, at the time, uh, the number of state employees that work at this particular complex is uh, around 1,500. Um, and it's a range from the Department of Public Safety to a lot of the human service agencies that serve the state of Vermont, um, providing really vital functions for uh, the citizenry. So the Winooski River, uh, which is um, in uh, the backfield off of the state office complex, um, has flooded in the past, um, but it has not impacted any of the buildings. Um, with Irene, however, um, north and south components of the river um, began to flood and closed off essentially access uh, north and south to uh, the town of Waterbury. Um, water levels continued to rise. Um, state buildings, including our state hospital, um, which is for um, people with uh, emotional issues um, and criminal emotional issues, um, had to be evacuated as uh, water began to, to flood the system. The other part about the state office complex that back in 1950, um, when it was constructed, the majority of the buildings were all connected by underground tunnels, um, which in the winter in Vermont is a great thing, but when you're flooding, it just simply becomes a conduit to spread a lot of water around. The Department of Public Safety building is connected by one tunnel, um, which did in fact fill with water and did start bringing water into the basement um, of the building. Um, no actual flood waters reached uh, from the outside of the public safety building, which is also part of our state crime lab. So the building itself did not um, have external water. Um, there were issues with water coming into the basement, um, and that impacted uh, the power system that did feed the building as well as some of the phone um, and therefore internet connectivity. The decision around uh, mid-evening on Sunday of Irene was that we needed to relocate and evacuate our emergency operations center. Now earlier, as Kevin was pointing out, um, you need things like redundancy. You need to think about you know, alternate plans and options. And we uh, had some of those in place, um, but we were also transitional in that our state EOC uh, actually had just completed uh, mostly a two-year renovation process, and we had only moved back into the building uh, for two weeks. So we were in a state of, of real flux in terms of an ability to fully function at the EOC level for the state, um, as well as determine what equipment and stuff we needed to move um, with literally minutes notice um, based on the um, unforeseen flooding that actually came into the complex. At any rate, we did evacuate and back to uh, having uh, FEMA in state and having 200 FEMA employees, um, they had rented um, a very large office building in uh, the city of Burlington um, called the Joint Field Office, or JFO. And this is the coordination point where they will take all of the disaster information they collect from around the state and uh, detail it, uh, make sure it's all valid, and also issue the reimbursement uh, checks for uh, restoration projects for uh, individual and public properties. So we were able to, in very short order, um, since FEMA is a temporary office space, they're very resilient at moving things around, fortunately. And we sent our whole emergency operations staff um, up to uh, the Burlington location, um, having to drive through uh, six to eight inches of water um, to get out. Uh, everyone did get out in time. But inherent and lost in this process was our Department of Public Safety uh, internet connectivity, um, our phone system and our radio connectivity. Uh, we maintain two Abtech consoles here um, for our low band and uh, public service and Vermont Agency of Transportation uh, connection networks. Um, and I'll talk about those as uh, we get a little further into the program. But that connectivity was lost. And what that meant was that we weren't able to access um, a lot of our emergency um, points um, to get a handle on uh, some of the disaster events taking place as well as matching resources. And the Emergency Operations Center is not really a command center. Um, its role is to provide resources and assistance to the local communities um, based on uh, the amount of need they have. It's really a one-stop shop for resources. 
and we weren't able, we didn't have the mechanisms for the better part of a day and a half to get that information out. So another vote for some of the redundancy that we had built in, but it wasn't fully connected, um, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Vermonters do not like shelters. Um, Vermonters uh, like to, um, again, we have three to four months of sub-zero weather in some cases, so uh, getting a Vermonter to get out of their building, uh, their home, and access some of our shelters uh, usually means that the event is very significant. And so we had several shelters that were, were open, and then subsequent ones that had to be opened because buildings were actually destroyed. And there's kind of more to a disaster than just the water rolling through your building, um, because that often brings a lot of contaminants. Um, you, if you have, particularly in our, our Waterbury State Office complex, several of the generators overturned, and that water that was around therefore filled up with diesel uh, residue, and that diesel residue floated into many of the basements, and that makes it uninhabitable. It has to be cleaned, and that's a then you're into months. Uh, for recovering the building for any kind of occup occupancy. And that occurred at the, the residential level as well. So we had uh, a record number of over 30 community-based shelters open um, to provide uh, help to citizens who were displaced or forced to evacuate. The story of the power loss, um, we did have uh, 50,000 customers at uh, peak with lost power. That's um, Again, about a little less than one-sixth of our state was not uh, receiving power. Um, it really, um, to the credit of the uh, electrical utilities, they had brought in uh, companies and extra assistance uh, from Hydro-Quebec and other Canadian uh, power companies, uh, several hundred crews, in fact, and they were pre-staged probably two to three days before the hurricane even arrived. So in record time, um, power was actually restored um, to a lot of the communities. Uh, they were able to do that well ahead of actual um, road access being restored, because many of the roads were actually so uh, destroyed, but they were still able to get some kind of electrical functionality into communities, which um, was very lucky. Uh, we Fortunately, this occurred kind of late summer in Vermont, so the temperature was still um, reasonable um, so that people were not um, in an uh, exhaustive heat exhaustion kind of level, and they weren't in a freezing cold kind of range. It was kind of right in the middle, so that fortunately was very lucky. That luck, however, is running out as we approach our snow season. Um, we're starting to see little bits of snow in our, our upper hills and mountains now, uh, and the temperature is going to drop down into uh, some very cold uh, areas fairly soon. So a lot of the uh, residences that people are still living in but are not uh, ready for the winter, um, that is one of our, our ongoing challenges. Town isolation was not something we had dealt before with that emergency management. Um, yes, we have flash floods and uh, the typical number of culverts on average per Vermont town is 800. So with 800 uh, potential culverts in each town, yep, we do lose roads, but there's usually different options. But we actually had some of our communities that are located near the spines of the Green Mountains who were simply isolated. Um, bridges and roads were destroyed in so many places that it made them absolutely impassable. Um, and so there was very significant road loss, uh, which we can talk about here in a couple slides. Initially, we estimated uh, roughly 250 local roads were closed. That ended up going well over 500 um, in our state. We did have, very unfortunately, six um, Irene-related deaths. Um, these were not related to actual um, citizens getting surprised by the flash floods. These were more related to people um, trying to um, traverse um, or get to different areas um, due to um, the significant flooding. We had an unfortunate story of a father and son who actually, um, during the night of the hurricane, went up to check the uh, city reservoir located um, near the town of Rutland, Vermont, uh, kind of in the north, or sorry, the southern central part of our state. Um, and while they were uh, driving up to check some of the, the relay pumps to make sure they were operational, um, part of the roadway and an embankment uh, that they were 
uh, near completely gave way and they were washed uh, into a flash flood circumstance and unfortunately didn't survive. Part of our disaster response is federal assistance. Uh, we already had FEMA in, uh, in state and, uh, and able to provide us, but we do have to have the specific declarations. Uh, an emergency declaration was signed by the president um, very shortly after Katrina came, I'm sorry, Irene came through. And uh, it allows for a lot more federal resources to be uh, mustered and brought into our, our state. A little bit more about the response highlights. Um, almost every state road was impacted. Um, 133 uh, state roads were closed and 30 state bridges. In the lower left, you'll see one of those bridges that was washed out. Um, it's probably can't quite see, but someone has uh, written in very large white, probably chalk, RIP, rest in peace. Um, and this sort of bridge scenario was very common where um, it was there were simply not enough resources to restore them. These are the kind of bridges that you know have to be built over a summer, uh, take several months. Um, these are not just sort of small bridgeways. So this was part of the big access issues um, for communities. And there were several stories on the news of, uh, well, school was going to resume, and so people would have to walk across the stream bed, go up a ladder, get onto the road, maybe go down another ladder, cross the stream bed, and finally get to where the bus was able to reach them. Um, pretty amazing stories of, uh, of uh, the hardiness of uh, the Vermonters uh, wanting just to keep things going. The National Guard was also a, a very big um, player in our response. Uh, together with FEMA, we had 16 commodity trailers. These are 18-wheel trailers that uh, came up from uh, Massachusetts with things like water and blankets um, and just those initial um, critical items you need for uh, basic uh, comfort and survival. Um, 28 of uh, towns were provided air support. Uh, we had uh, helicopters from several different National Guard, uh, state National Guard uh, guards coming in and they were doing airdrops of water and various supplies into some of the isolated communities. Um, 64 towns were serviced by ground. I'm, my suspicion is that number is actually uh, fairly higher. But we're talking about sort of the top topography of Vermont and uh, on that right picture you can see our our Route 4, which goes uh, east-west roughly um, in our state, and it uh, goes up to Killington, one of our primary ski areas in our state. Uh, traversed a lot, high amount of traffic, links a lot, but you can see on the right side the post-flash flood era where we have those smaller streams that again are overloaded with water, and then uh, they just meander in and clearly just are, are um, eroding significant parts of the road. And this, you know, you, you know, didn't have just one washout. You had multiple washouts of one road, which made it uh, just extremely difficult um, for any kind of emergency service access. Um, and the long-term support uh, of, of restoring that, uh, the amount of fill, just basic gravel fill, um, is continuing to be one of our, our largest challenges. So a few more, uh, some more footage. Um, the top left there, that's uh, one of the washouts. If you just look at the height of that uh, erosion that occurred and imagine that the water had to be at that level, um, there's an excavator roughly in the middle uh, of the photo, and that's probably a 25 to 30 foot high bank, and they've actually built that up some. So that, I mean, that's just one area requiring um, repairs. The lower left is very similar. Um, just huge amounts of fill and gravel was um, eroded out uh, that impacts the roadway, but also along some of these roadways and railroad tracks are fiber optic cables uh, and different communication pathways that are carried um, as, you know, as part of the road direction. So very significant amounts of, uh, of uh, utility and infrastructure uh, impact. And then some of the restoration efforts um, on the top right, and then the National Guard. Uh, we had a significant amount of engineers come in from uh, the state of Maine's National Guard who worked here for several weeks just to restore uh, emergency access. Um, the National Guard has a, an edict that they can uh, do disaster recovery operations up to the point that they can restore 
um, reasonable and primarily emergency access. They, they cannot compete with private industries, so at the point they so if we get in that range, um, the guard units returned, and uh, most of the primary emergency access sites had been restored, uh, thanks a lot to, uh, to their work. So as we get to the last few slides, uh, the scope of recovery um, is, is just massive for our state. Uh, our State Emergency Oper Operations Center um, switched to what we called recovery operations. That meant some of the, the real emergent issues um, had been dealt with um, by uh, several days later on September 12th. Um, 225 of our 251 towns were impacted in some way by uh, Tropical Storm Irene. So it's, it's the, the recovery has affected uh, a very wide uh, net of impact um, of different, different needs from infrastructure repair, public facilities repair, uh, repair, or repair, as well as individuals who um, are, a lot of their challenges are um, having to fix things themselves because the cost, even with FEMA reimbursement, uh, far exceeds what uh, they can do. A major disaster declaration was uh, received from uh, the President on uh, September 1st. Um, FEMA assigned it a number. That's actually about the fifth or sixth FEMA disaster declaration number that we've had this year uh, due to the earlier flooding. Um, public assistance, and there's a couple of different uh, ways. How does FEMA help? I'll just spend a very short amount of time on this. Um, public assistance, meaning any state or municipal impacted um, structure or community. Um, was uh, approved for all of our 13 counties. Uh, individual assistance, that means the homeowner, the citizen, um, that assistance was declared for 12 counties uh, in our state, which is very significant um, because Vermont does not have a disaster relief fund. We do not have any kind of disaster mechanism that is turned on to provide um, assistance in the event um, of catastrophe. So having federal assistance is absolutely essential towards uh, our state's recovery. FEMA had uh, their disaster recovery centers, or DRCs, open, and those are centers that they will open up to uh, allow citizens to come in and register their damage. And one of our biggest challenges is making sure that every citizen documents every single ounce of uh, hurricane, uh, tropical storm impact uh, at their residence so that they can get the maximum amount a reimbursement. Uh, FEMA typically will reimburse 75% um, of the mapped out cost of uh, recovering your property and that funding is based not to return your your home for example to um, the pristine condition that it was before. It is um, metered so that it's going to return your residence to a livable condition, a livable safe condition. So the economics are always a little bit of challenging in this. One of the other unfortunate things that happened is that we had a lot of historical and cultural loss um, in our state. Um, a lot of town clerk offices and things like that flooded. Um, that's very significant. If a small town loses its tax revenue generating uh, capability, that obviously has huge impacts um, towards how it's going to function in the future. So. There were a lot of different historical and cultural sites that were lost um, from commercial, residential, governmental, educational, um, those sorts of things that um, are still going to be a long-term challenge uh, for our state just to, to recover. Um, even in this age of electronic backup, um, some of those things just simply weren't uh, available. And the picture is uh, Rochester on, I believe it's Route 125, and that's at the base of one of the Green Mountains, um, and that's just one of the roads, one of many that was victimized by the, the flash flooding. A quick summary of what the uh, overall recovery costs are looking like uh, based on the numbers of damage um, are can be sort of seen in a snapshot of the uh, public assistance uh, information and what FEMA PDA or pre-disaster assessment, that's an initial assessment uh, by FEMA not based on very specific numbers of the amount of damage that's occurred. Um, and these are just public properties 
Um, 709 um, different buildings were declared damaged. 423 um, are considered major, um, owner destroyed, uh, 101. Um, these are just public entities, not to mention the, the hundreds and hundreds of individual um, sites that are also uh, are impacted. So on the lower right um, <clears throat> is down in, uh, I believe it's Stockbridge, but one of the things that also is, has happened is that um, the local first response emergency management directors, fire departments, police, and EMS are simply overwhelmed, um, and town governments are simply overwhelmed by the magnitude of the impact of uh, Tropical Storm Irene. And it's, it's caused a lot of people um, to have to the breaking point um, because they just simply have just too much on their plate and it's just uh, too overwhelming um, given what's happened. The other part that's uh, coming up, uh, like I said before, is that we have winter approaching, so a lot of these towns have a, a huge amount of, of issues ahead of them just to get ready for winter, um, and they have no budgets, they have no uh, equipment uh, really to, to handle it like they, they typically would. For pers perspective on the lower right are a couple snapshots from our state office complex uh, within uh, a couple days following the actual flooding. So you can see we've got very tall, uh, three to four story brick buildings. They all have uh, basements. Um, and then the lower right, those are copiers um, inundated with water. Um, the amount of debris and cleanup um, is just um, massive. Um, you have to put the debris somewhere. Um, you have to determine whether it's hazardous. Um, all of these sorts of things have to be factored in into your recovery. Um, you can clean it up, but it also simply has to go somewhere. So currently at the Waterbury State Office Complex, um, none of the uh, buildings are operational with the exception of where I happen to work, the Department of Public Safety building. That was uh, spared flooding um, like we talked before. A little bit about the numbers. Um, the just in federal highway damage, uh, the estimates are five to seven million um, public assistance. Again, that's uh, public infrastructure damage, 120 million. Um, and then into the, the homes, the citizens were in the 18 million um, range of simply distributed uh, assistance for people who have been impacted. One of the absolute beautiful things was that, again, since FEMA was in town, we were able to move through some of the operational paperwork um, in record time, and that meant that people were actually being issued um, dollars for recovery efforts within days of the event. And based on our on historic uh, federal declarations in Vermont, um, that often takes oh two to four weeks anyway just to get the paperwork and that process uh, in place. So we're actually able to see some relief efforts on the at, from the from federal assistance very quickly, um, which was uh, really fantastic. Some of the uh, the uh, businesses are eligible for what are called SBA or small business administration loans, uh, low interest loans. Um, those quickly are into the 13.5 million range. All in all, we're these are some earlier numbers, um, we will be over a billion, that's with a B, um, just for the state of Vermont for recovery. And in our economic times, uh, particularly in our state, um, that is uh, very much a significant issue um, and is going to have just amazing budget challenges uh, probably into the next uh, decade, I would say. Some of the, uh, we do have, uh, when we reach out to other states um, through what's called EMAC or Emergency Management Assistance Compact, um, those assets that came in were in about the, the 14 million range. Um, and then uh, there's some federal assistance that were just on the initial side um, of just assets like trucks and radios and those sorts of things, which ran into the $5 million uh, zone pretty quickly. So kind of to, to conclude, what we're talking a lot about, AvTech and uh, redundancy. Uh, in 2010, we were able to purchase two AvTech uh, consoles uh, with the intent of them having the plug and play, what I call the simplified very much uh, capability, uh, having a 
uh, VP gate um, that you uh, can simply plug into anywhere would give us access to our radio communication systems that we at emergency management depend on. Our state is served by a microwave ring. Uh, we have a few large mount top systems um, that are all connected by a redundant microwave system. Um, that during the whole Hurricane Katrina was um, still operational and never failed. It has a lot of redundant loopage. Um, through it, and that's the conduit that we are able to hit our mountaintop radio systems with. With our AFTEC console system, um, we maintain a what's called a low band network, um, which uh, we are able to use uh, for contacting some of the major players in infrastructure management for our state. So that would be all of our major utilities that provide power and our uh, gas systems. Um, the National Weather Service is linked to it as well. Uh, we have two weather services offices that serve Vermont. One is in Burlington and the other is in Albany, New York. The FEMA Regional Coordination Center, which is actually located in Maynard, Mass, is also able to be linked to this network. So we actually have a federal um, contact point with this console system. And the National Guard, um, we're actually uh, in terms of expanding our system, and Todd and I have talked about this and are going to have further discussions about uh, bringing the National Guard on into the network, um, which, again, linking the resources but maintaining redundant parts. Um, that wide area network is really critical, so you have different input points that in the event of, oh, hey, your state emergency operations center is flooded, um, you need to go somewhere else. Um, you can still maintain 100% or close to 100% connectivity because you have a, a WAN system, and these consoles are, are very helpful with that. The agency of transportation is also part of this network, uh, and we're actually expanding the linkage uh, with them as well. And then in the, the southeast part of our town, uh, we have, our again, our Vermont nuclear power plant where we have our networks that go down into that as well. Um, so there's significant amount of uh, connectivity that's absolutely critical for that, that portion of the state. So one of the questions for uh, you know, everyone who is listening um, is to simply ask, you know, what is your redundancy? Uh, when we flooded uh, here, we had to leave within minutes. Um, our console system was not immediately available, although we were in short order able to reestablish it at the joint field office of FEMA up in Burlington simply because we had um, internet connectivity and we were able to set that up and that immediately gave us um, huge access to some of the recovery efforts um, and as well as just it's always fantastic redundancy to have that with your utility companies and weather service and those sorts of things. So a um, little bit different. Um, from some examples where there's uh, a law enforcement or a fire and police EMS, our, our mission with emergency management is more of an infrastructure uh, down to the local citizenry level uh, network. And so this uh, console system um, has, has been the solution for it. Um, we're going to further expand the capability of it um, to bring on um, other different services, uh, especially with the National Guard, is going to provide us some some very effective redundancy. So it's, uh, it was one of our, uh, in the face of a large scale failure, as Kevin had talked about in the initial slides, which we certainly had, um, we were able to uh, use this technology to bring back a network which, you know, absent this technology, I, I just wouldn't know, know how we would, would have been able to do that. So I appreciate everyone's time. I certainly have probably talked um, longer than we had expected, but I am uh, certainly uh, would also like to just hear a few stories. I know Todd uh, Goat had some, uh, some uh, observations as well from uh, the storm. Oh, uh, thanks, Rob. Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, t you were talking about the roads, and it uh, <laughs> reminded me I had to go down to deliver some radios to uh, one of the fire departments that was in need. And they were one of the towns that was isolated for four or five days. They had no roads open. And so finally when they got the roads open and they were able to communicate out, they, you know, called for help. And uh, I uh, you know, didn't know what I was going to get into, but um, they were only allowing emergency vehicles and construction vehicles through. And 
it still amazes me they actually let me through because those roads you see in the pictures, that's what I was driving on. And everywhere there was a culvert, it was carved out like 50 feet. And the construction guys just threw rocks and dirt in there. And fortunately, I had a four-wheel drive vehicle. So the fire department was <laughs> surprised and uh, pleased that they actually let me through. But uh, it was uh, pretty intense. Did uh, anyone have any questions? Thanks very much, Robert and uh, Todd. Uh, we're going to go ahead and open it up for questions. If there's any questions, go ahead and submit them into the form at the end, and uh, Todd or Robert or Kevin can get to your questions. We'll give it just, just a few moments for uh, people to get them submitted, if there are any. And uh, we'll start wrapping it up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, well, people are thinking about uh, questions. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, the commercial side of my business uh, saw an impact as well. Uh, Green Mountain Coffee, also located in Waterbury, uh, was affected, and they had to evacuate buildings. And what's interesting is um, one of the first things that is can they connect their radio system to their other buildings uh, over IP because their cell phones went down. Uh, I'm not sure which carrier they were on, but uh, uh, they discovered right away that uh, having your own internal system makes a big difference. Uh, and uh, the England Central Railroad, uh, they weren't able to move trains for several days. And they're already talking about backup dispatch as well. And the same question keeps coming up. It's all about backup, redundancy, and uh, IP. Okay, thank you. It doesn't look like we have any questions at this time, so uh, we appreciate you attending the webinar this afternoon, and we're going to end it. And again, as mentioned before, this webinar will be available on demand on the Higher Ground website, capture911.com. Thanks so much for attending. Bye.